Okay, so Aaron is getting us set up. Now, he said you would be drinking whiskey. Yeah, uh, one down. <laughs> no, I thought that would be a little, I didn't want that to be tacky. I want to make sure I had permission first before I go grab a whiskey. Oh, but. please go grab one because Ooh. I got a, bo- a little bubbly just to have a drink with you. Ooh, we're done. Yeah, I'll be right back. Ahead. Two seconds. Yay! Look at this guy. Much better. Okay, let's get this podcast started right, my friend. What Uh you got there? Cheers. Bullet bourbon. Cheers. Bullet bourbon. Little ginger beer. Oh, that sounds nice. I don't I don't drink bourbon, so I need you to give me a crash course. I am drinking fancy, fancy what I call basic bitch juice is white wine, but this is Prosecco. So it's it's like, you know, white wine with flair. Oh yeah. So. Little frizzant, little bubbles. Yeah. So. Oh we <laughs> so mm-hmm. thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and get into it and we're just having a conversation. Nice and chill. Twenty minutes maybe. If I don't get off on like a fangirl, let's talk about all your food tangent. So no, we're 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 gonna get off a couple tangents, I'm sure. But that's the fun part. It is. It gives Aaron something to do to edit out. He I'm loves in no that. rush. <laughs> Okay, so I am here with one of the best chefs I have ever had the chance of knowing, which is such a treat to get to know him. This is the wonderful Jesse Edmonds of Seven Hills Hospitality, including Liberty, Hawthorne, El Cochinero, and my personal little baby favorite, Bar 1903. Jesse, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's always fun to hang out. Oh, it is. Fun. I don't. I got to see Brie the other night. We ordered Liberty to go for our date night, and I was sitting in the parking lot like a good little girl, waiting for my order to come out. And I saw this lovely little thing bouncing across the parking lot with a big box of food. Like, hi, we miss you. So it was good to see her. Like, even the in the ponytails just bouncing. Yes, one hundred, and still cute, even in a mask. Like, she's the best. But yeah, we obviously like we did tacos that night. We did. <laughs> the El Cochinero side. But so the way you and I met, I had been eating your food before we met. Mm -hmm. Um, Big fan of, we got hooked on the Liberty brunch. God bless. Shrimp and grits, mimosas. You just can't go wrong there, you know? So we started going, doing the brunch thing. And then I got to meet you because you needed some design work. And in my non podcast pillow life, I'm a designer. I'm an interior designer. So I got to meet with you and Brianna at Liberty. And that's when I realized you are a Renaissance man. Like you have so many, don't be like, this is going to happen the whole time. So just deal with it. You, The numerous ways in which you are talented is fascinating to me. So I want you to start with how you got into food. And then I want to talk about your extremely impressive, like, handcrafting woodworking construction skills uh uh, food um hmm. well long and short of it i basically um uh you know was raised by a single mom and i unfortunately was this big and ugly when i was about 13 14 years old pretty much lied about my age and got a job uh washing dishes at 13 years old to help mom pay the bills oh my god get out of middle school, um, eighth grade, essentially, and um, would go and wash dishes for 35 to 40 hours a week on the weekends, um, and basically just give all that money to her so she could make rent, um, pay for groceries, whatever needed to happen. So I kind of got into it out of necessity, and then started to learn to cook, started to make sandwiches, scoop ice cream, pull espresso shots, and kind of work in, uh, actually in Havana, uh, a couple small cafes up there. So did that all through high school, always worked 40 hours a week minimum. Um, and then when it came time to figure out what to do with college, it basically was like, well, I was on the aerospace engineering path because my dad's a nuclear and civil engineer. Um, <clears throat> so I was heavily into that. I basically hit Calc 3 and was like, and screw this crap. So um, <laughs> stopped and basically just was like, well, now what do I do? If I, if I don't want to do the math, if I don't really want to do this kind of stuff, 
what do I want to do? Well, I have been doing this for at that point, probably five or six years and didn't completely suck at it. Um, and so ended up going to FSU's hospitality program. Yeah. And that's an impressive pro- program. What Dedman School of Hospitality, right? Yeah, so did that and then double majored in business, um, about four minors, little things, because I was a law student for a while. Um, so did a bunch of random stuff and uh, yeah, basically graduated college and went to the Biltmore in North Carolina in oh, Asheville. Wow. That's where I met Bree. Um, oh, you got her from, I didn't know that you brought her back to us. Good job. Stole her, stole her from the mountains. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, she she's a French trained pastry chef originally. So she's Le Cordon Bleu um, and was actually one of the pastry chefs at the Biltmore. And we met and I suckered her into, you know, thinking I was a cool guy and tricked her good and brought her home. So well done. Well uh, done. Long and of it. But yeah, basically just cooking was kind of uh, it's just it was always there. And um, I like working with my hands. I like the stress. I like the chaos. I like the culture um money's garbage but you know it is what it is you follow your passion right um yeah. so uh yeah that's pretty much it i mean mom was an architect and a contractor for 20 years dad's a civil and nuclear engineer so i grew up under drafting tables i grew up under on construction sites um around craftsmen and so that's kind of where i think a lot of that came from so that every time i have a conversation with you i am more fascinated by what you tell me i when I first did the tour of Liberty with you and Brie and you showed me the bar and we're Aaron's going to edit in some photos because I want people that maybe haven't been there to see what we're talking about. But I was talking about like you wanted to do a little bit of a refresh in there. And I was telling you all of the things that I loved about the bar. And one of the things was the physical bar itself because it's got this beautiful like copper, um, copper top and like rounded edge. And then it's like this beautiful wood. And then you drop, oh, yeah, my dad and I built that together. Yeah, well, actually, Rick's dad and I built that together. And Rick, okay. me, Rick and Rick's dad. Rick's dad is, like, again, going back to being surrounded by unbelievable craftsmen. Uh, that was actually Rick's father, who that man is just, oh, So just, talented. Uh, he's just unbelievable. He builds classic cars. And so he'll do, he'll buy like a rusted out 1941 Ford pickup truck. And well, they don't make those parts anymore. So this man will literally craft the parts. He'll make the dashboard out of metal. He'll shape the metal. And he's just unbelievable. It's always funny because we did so much woodwork in Liberty, but he's a metal guy. So he yeah. actually, he made and welded the frame that the community table sits on. Uh-huh. Holes. Um, he helped us with that stuff. But then we'd go to do wood. And he was just like, I don't know what the hell you boys are doing, but... <laughs> But it turned out amazing because, you know, you were involved in that beautiful bar, all the wood, at least. And then you had handmade all the tables. And then I found out that you have these pendant lights that are made from bottles of what's the bourbon? It's a bourbon, Blends. right? Blends. Yeah. Blends whiskey. And it's um, every bottle was signed by a bartender that had worked there. Yep. And so you have all these beautiful like stories. And it was just so fascinating to see how much of yourself had been put into that bar and you know it's a restaurant with amazing food but it still has that kind of you know welcoming i talked to um we've we've done an interview with steve and sarah bolander of chop and liberty i feel like kind of has the same vibe as i said chop sort of has like a cheers sort of feel you walk in and you feel at home and welcome and i really feel like liberty has that as well and i know you have other places but liberty's the one that we've gone to the most that was us. I mean, that was me, Rick and Thomas, my two original partners. Um, you know, the three of us really put our heart and soul into it and really kind of focused in on that vibe because we wanted it to be a community location. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it was really cool. I mean, we have, we had no money, so we had to build it. I mean, we started that business with $70,000, which is not a lot of money for restaurants. It is not a lot of money for any business. <laughs> and, and you think it is, it. but it is not. No, no, it, it's unbelievable how fast you can watch that kind of money just evaporate. And especially when you have to put a kitchen together. Well, <laughs> if you had seen the original kitchen, you'd laugh because it wasn't a kitchen. It was basically an empty room with a couple prep tables, a couple induction burners, and basically me and Patrick just sweating our nuts off trying to like <laughs> make it happen and like figure it out. I mean, we literally had a tabletop oven. And the kitchen was practically empty. Now it's got a bunch of toys in it. Now you've got nice stuff. I had no idea when I was sitting there eating my delicious brunch that you guys were just slinging back there on hot plates, basically. 
Yeah, basically Walmart hot plates. We didn't even have a hood when we opened. We were using induction and we didn't even have a hood. I mean, that's $24,000. Like that's right. a third of our budget. And we were just like, no, we can't do that. So That's amazing. So what year was that? 2014. We opened in February of 14. So it was thir- so winter of 13 when we were building everything out. So. so you've gone in six years from, you know, hot plate kitchen nightmare to you've got four successful locations now and hopefully if we survive the pandemic (laughs) right and that's one of the things like i know that you guys have had a lot of i mean you own a restaurant you own multiple restaurants like that's a really stressful business to be in to get through the pandemic so like how have you guys how have you been able to pivot i've seen some ways that you've been able to pivot to curbside and things like that but what have you guys had to do to be able to cope with this covid situation besides you know tears and curled up in a ball well mostly yeah just basically living in existential crisis um but it, it, it honestly we we went from 90 staff members down to 22 Oof. so we had to pretty much lay off as many people as possible um we had to consolidate that was the big part we had to create every efficiency we possibly could then we had to explore anything and everything we could do to make a dollar so that's why you know we fell back to pizza. That's why we launched pizza at Hawthorne. I mean, a lot of bakeries do pizza, especially because if you do like a sourdough crust, it makes sense in with a bread focused bakery. But we had this Cadillac of a pizza oven over there. So we're like, well, why the hell are we not doing pizza? It sells and that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, and it's something we were going to keep through, for, you know, post pandemic because it's actually done really, really well. And we're, I think one of only two places or three places that do true wood fired Neapolitan style pizza now. Nice. So it kind of kind of formed a niche, but um, yeah, just consolidating, being as hyper efficient as possible, um, being uh, as aggressive as possible with every possible opportunity for aid, every grant, every government program, anything that we could possibly do, we got our hands on it. So um, now here's hoping they forgive it and do what they said they were going to do. Right. <laughs> That'll be the next That's trick. So but stressful. Yeah. Oh. So. Um, it'll be interesting. I mean, the EIDL loan, you know, they came out with this EIDL grant for, um, you know, back in the summer and they're like, yeah, $10,000 just apply. And now the PPP comes out and they say, yeah, but now you can't, if you got the EIDL grant, you're, you, that's where they're going to reduce your forgiveness amount. So I still have to pay it back. It's not a grant. Right. Um, so I'm just kind of like, cool. Thanks for the added debt on the balance sheet guys. Appreciate yeah. it. And navigating all of that seems like it could almost be a full-time job. It pretty much is. It's I basically pivoted my office person into basically just being purely a loan and grant writer. Wow. So that's nuts. And in the meantime, you obviously have months where you have no income from the restaurants. But then there were some moments where I know that we participated in it and I hope that it was kind of a boost for you guys that local food groups organized um What did they even call those? It feels like that was a hundred years ago when we would all come and like, it was like a food weekend and we'd like. Yeah, it was like a blitz or something, like a foodie blitz or something like that. Yeah, but I just remember um, going, I ordered from you guys and pulling up to the parking lot and the whole parking lot was wrapped all the way around. There were so many people. Yeah, for the the bread. bread. Oh my gosh, that was insane. Yeah, Yeah, we sold 300 loaves of bread in 45 minutes. Oh my God. It was amazing. And I saw people that we knew in line, like we were all like waving at each other from our cars, like, Hey, so like there are, I know it's a nightmare for you, but then there are some like really sweet things that I feel like have come out of it and that, you know, you're able to do things like that in the community and at least get a little bit of, not that it's keeping your doors open, but at least have something that is. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Yeah, well, and, and kind of to that point, though, I mean, you know, Hawthorne um, was always kind of the smallest of the four. It had the smallest presence and was always just kind of it's doing its own little thing. That was definitely more of a scratch my own personal kind of um, creative itch in a lot of ways. Right but then, mm-hmm. but yeah, but then, you know, having the opportunity to really get the name out so intently um, in that process, honestly, of all four concepts, that's the concept that's come back and it's already passed pre-COVID revenue. That's great. It's stronger than it was before we closed because of the fact that through that, we were able to focus commodities. So we were able to focus on loaves of bread and things that could travel well better than anything else. I mean, what makes Liberty Liberty is 
going and standing and seeing your friends and getting at the bar and getting in a group of people and having a good time and getting rowdy. All the things that will literally kill you now. Um, yeah. so Liberty is one of those. Liberty is going to be the hardest to fight back. That's going to take the longest. It's going to be the hardest to really bring back the essence of what makes Liberty Liberty. Because um, it's such a hangout. Like we, my girlfriends, I have my little core group. It's it's me, my sister, and our two other best girlfriends. And we have girls night. Used to have it like every other month. And we just got to the point where we stopped even trying to entertain the idea of going to other places. We were just like, fuck it. We're just going to Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> like why are we why are we even playing around we know where we want to go and Aaron and I also like it's just like our it feels like our neighborhood place you know and one of the things that I love is your drink your drink menus are insane your drink menus make me feel dumb and I am a smart person your drink menus are beautiful and our favorite I still can't remember the real name of it but Aaron and I call it he knows what do we call it baby Purple drink. Purple drink. Yes. And I still don't know what was in it. But that's one of our absolute favorites. But we could go in even after it was off the menu. And I would ask one of the bartenders like, hey, can you make me a purple drink? And they're like, is that that one? I said, yes, that's the name of it. And they would just make it on the spot. So it's like, it's very much that home like atmosphere. And I can't wait. We're not going to restaurants right now. We're doing takeout, obviously, to support. But I uh, can't wait to be back in there and can't wait to be back in 1903 because that place is so beautiful. It's t Tell me about, I mean, tell everyone else about the story. I, I know how beautiful it is and what happened there. But uh, Well, um, it was one of those situations. So we know we're moving Costa Nero to a new location. Right. Um, so that we started, we actually got the ball rolling online in April of 2019. So it has been almost two years uh, of blood, sweat, tears, and treasure. Uh, but it keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed. So we thought it was finally going to happen in maybe October, November of last year. Um, the landlords were finally moving on the bigger building that, that's adjacent to it. And so we had kind of geared up to get ready to really put our blood, sweat, you know, put our efforts into Cosanero. And the landlords essentially called me. And they said, hey, we've got two big civil delays. It's going to be in the spring. I was like, damn it. That's fine. We'll figure it out. The next day, I basically get a call from um, a buddy of mine, Matt Cooper, who bought that building from Springtime Tallahassee. He literally purchased it, it seems like, on a whim. He pretty much was walking by to them bringing the, like, for sale sign out. He just walks by and just takes it from her. And it's just like, no, thank like, you. No, I got this. Call you, call you tomorrow. Like, <laughs> Um, so he buys it and he comes into Coast Scenario. He's talking about a former bar manager, like, you know, hey, like I bought this crazy building. I don't know what to do with it. Do you know anyone who has any ideas? I had always walked past it when I go to Luso um, and was just like, man, that building's super cool. Stars align. I meet with Matt and we start talking about the building. He probably had 30 people pitch him on doing something with the space, but most of them involved either causing severe damage to the building or modify, right. heavily modifying it. Um, or turning it into either a lawyer's office or some kind of a fundraising political that office. Won't. Exactly. And so he thought, you know, if I could bring something in that could open it to the public and maintain the integrity of the bar, then that's the option we go with. And so after kind of um, him and I sussing it out, it came together incredibly quick. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, well, I'm about to do Cosanero. I don't have time for this crap. I'm just going to go see what the building's about give them a little lip service and see what happens. And, and pretty much fell in love. <laughs> I walked in the front, literally the second I walked into the front door of the building, I looked up at that ceiling and I just went, Oh shit, here's number four. And <laughs> the lease three days later. So um, I had no, no plan. I had no idea what the hell I was going to do. I had no preconceived concept. It just kind of was like, shit, here's this building. Got to do what I can with it. So I pretty much got together with Jacob and Will, uh, my two bar managers, and we just were like, okay, let's put all of our collective experience together and make this happen. I brought an architect in who I'd worked with, uh, who is my architect for the new Cosanero. This guy specializes in renovation, and we pretty much just, in about three weeks, had a plan. That's amazing. And somehow we found a liquor license. We bought a liquor license and figured it all out and made it happen, so... And it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful in there. And it's such a, it's such a, just like fascinating and welcoming. And it feels very like classy, but you don't feel like stuffy in there. I just, we, 
We love it so much. It's like one of the best spots in town. And I remember having a conversation with you once about how much we both love the idea of like Italian. We went to Italy a few years ago and we did, um, what's the word, babe? Chiquetti. I knew it was a C. I couldn't think of it. But the idea of like a chiquetti crawl where you walk around to the different bars and you can get a drink and a little small bite and hang out there for a minute and then walk to the next bar. And so I feel like your little corner there between Eluso and between you at 1903. And then um, maybe, you know, an, another, oh, down the street next to Doubletree. Who's that guy? Yvonne Adams. You've got yes. um, Rootstock. Um, that was open. So I I think they're still open. I'm not quite sure, but um, either way, yeah. But I mean, there's uh, literally within two and a half blocks, you have four or five little places you can hit. Now Chuck's Fish is open. Yeah. Um, their sushi is insane. Is so, it? That's great. Like, grab, a, grab a roll and a drink, then walk over 1903. Grab something else. Finish Let's up. make it happen. Let's put this on our like 2021 vision board. Yeah. So just yeah, it's this should be really cool. I love it. Um, so Aaron keeps me on track. And I actually have a structure to this, which is, I know is shocking. We've already talked about COVID. We've already talked about your businesses, which is great. Um, one of the things that I'm asking everyone is my segment that I like to call Shit Happens. I want you to tell me about a time that you failed and how you overcame it. And, you know, if you were able to learn something from it. Yeah. it doesn't have to so be how long do you have? Right. <laughs> Just pick one. Narrow it down. So many options here. Let it be podcast appropriate. Right. Um, oh, God. Uh, honestly, Hawthorne won. So Hawthorne, you know, is two iterations. Um, Hawthorne won was, I don't think it was, mm, there were a lot of factors involved in that. So, you know, it's now the bakery, which I'm right. incredibly happy with. That's, that's what it should have been from the beginning. But you had kind of a fine dining concept in there, right? Exactly. So what we did was we looked at the space and at the time I thought, you know, okay, you know, I need to be like setting myself as a quote unquote, like chef and be serious and all this kind of crap. And, um, <laughs> I, you know, the space came up and it was one of those kind of not knee jerk, but it was a situation where I had a lot of people that were like, you can't let that space go. Cause it's next door to Liberty. It's so convenient. Exactly. It's very convenient. And also if someone else who is not a nice neighbor comes in, that could cause a lot more issues. So we went into the space I had this notion of fine dining, thought that, you know, I kind of had it all figured out and came up with beautiful branding. It was a nice space that, you know, a lot of, we did a lot of things right, but the thing where I absolutely failed was I did not have the infrastructure in place for the staff. I did not have um, as strong of support for the other restaurants. And I basically was stretching people too thin across three spots. Um, the other thing that happened was that two weeks after Hawthorne opened, um, that's when Brie went into the hospital for 21 days. Right. And yeah, that's when she went up and tried to die on me and, um, you know, it was super Ball not stones cool. tried to kill her. Yeah. Uh, everything else, pancreatitis and everything else went to hell and back. But so two weeks in, um, you know, I've already got this, this kicking, screaming baby of a restaurant and a staff who's just like, what the hell are we doing? And I have to be away. Yeah. So that was in the most vital moments when we were trying to set or establish our brand and create that goodwill to, to bring people to an area where people don't think of fine dining. So in that regard, not me not being able to split my time, me not having the proper management support, um, it crumbled, absolutely crumbled. It, it faltered. And um, I knew by, I opened it, we opened it in the beginning of October of 2017. By March, I was like, I don't want to do this. This is not right. Um, everyone is stretched too thin. Everyone is just not, it, there was no harmony. There was no happiness. There was no joy. So, but out of that though, that's where we actually took the first step in learning how to bake bread. So we always made our daily table bread. And that was the happiest moment of the day for everybody. Front of house, back of house, everybody was just baking the daily bread because we baked it in the wood fired oven. So we would bake it in the wood fired oven bring it out. And while it was still warm, cut the ends off that we weren't going to use for service and everyone would fight over it tooth and nail. And it was really, really good. So when, but I had always kind of wanted to do like a bread focused bakery because there is none in this town at all. No. Um, so all that being said, it kind of just clicked. Um, I was actually walking through Granville market in Vancouver and saw the bread stalls and how they did it. And it just immediately 
made sense for the space. I've got this beautiful wood fired oven that is designed for bread baking and pizza making. It's actually a hybrid oven. Um, was it, did it come with the building originally because there was like a wood fired pizza place there before? Yeah, it was Joe Mama's, um, which yep. was phenomenal. But um, so, but he actually brought in a modified pizza oven with a pizza oven. You have a particular dome height to bake pizzas at a certain temperature. Well, this one was modified so that you can also bake bread in it. And so again, stars align, you know, yeah. here's this like Ferrari sitting in the garage of this home I bought. <laughs> and it just all kind of clicked and we ended up just shutting Hawthorne down. Um, we transitioned me and the pastry chef at the time transitioned, spent four months teaching ourselves how to bake bread. And we settled on 10 different recipes. And those are the, the, the breads that we offer now. Um, and now we have a good team and we do a lot more savory. We explore a lot more of the savory of the baking um, and it brings joy. It's busy. It is, it's really fun and everyone involved in it is just happy now um so it's really really good but in learning the process of learning you know how to set up yourself for success um how to actually follow what you follow your heart in a lot of ways because i was really fighting that i felt like it was what i was supposed to do and in the process people got hurt because people lost their jobs when i had to position when i you know i i moved to think all but two people to other restaurants um and the two people that didn't were already moving so it it still kind of worked out. It, it wasn't a complete like disaster. Um, and obviously something beautiful came out of it, but recognizing my own limitations, staff limitations, what I should expect of them and vice versa. It just, it was a huge moment. Yeah. Um, but that's, that is, that's such a great example of like, yes, you have a setback and I think everyone's gut instinct. I know mine is if I fail at something, I just have that immediate like sucker punch feeling like, oh, how am I going to, I'm never going to recover from this. I can't show my face anywhere ever again. But you realize, you know, obviously that one, you, that one hiccup didn't doom you to failure in your other businesses. You're still doing great, except for COVID. God bless. We'll, we'll get through it. But, you know, I love, I love for people to see that failing is normal because so many times we present our best selves and everything's so cheery. The people that come up to us and say, oh, congratulations on all your success with pillows and i'm like okay. if you only knew the road <laughs> <laughs> you knew um yeah. and so i like for people to hear like the the story behind what's actually going on so and i also like to know that there is your olive loaf in this world because that olive loaf is out of control delicious thank you um it. well and, and you know it naming an entrepreneur who hasn't had failure right I, there isn't one. There's no successful one who hasn't. And the thing is, is that if you don't learn your limits, how are you going to grow from that? But the, at the end of the day, like that was no one else's fault. That was 100% on me. Why that did not work. It was really no one else's fault. And the thing is, though, is that there's also kind of this like peace in that. Knowing that the buck stops with me and I know I can fix that. Yes. So you're like, not it's having. Okay. Yeah, I totally get that because. I stress a lot less about our decisions for OFP because I'm making them, it's easier for me to make the decision, I think, because it's, it only affects us really. And it's, no one's going to be disappointed with me except me. So, you know, I do think it's a lot easier in that regard. It helps. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, obviously there were some people who were disappointed. I mean, they, some people believed in it. Some people, you know, wanted their jobs and stuff like that. They didn't want to evolve or change and that was fine. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, I know, I know why that failed and I know how to fix it from now on. And you so, can on. Yeah. And that's all you can do. So, and if something good comes out of it, like the olive loaf, then cool. So <laughs> that milk bread. <laughs> oh, I know. I need to get that one. I haven't had that one yet. We've got um, some new stuff in the works that are going to be. Ooh. Those cinnamon rolls. Sourdough bagels. Oh my God. Okay. See, we have to stop. I told you at the beginning, Sourdough this is going to be a problem. Sourdough pop tarts. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So I knew this would be a problem. I have to, I have to cut you. We cannot talk about food anymore. We need to get together and have a little distance backyard sesh and talk about food and you can make my mouth, my mouth water. Um, my final question, I know I can't believe it's already over, but final question. I want to know, how do you sleep at night? Are you sleeping on one pillow, five pillows? tossing turning do you sleep like a rock what's your deal i have i'm a side sleeper with three pillows okay 
So I've got one that's like a, it's kind of flat, like a memory cool, like mm -hmm. just basic, very flat one. The one that I actually hold to support my shoulders for being a side sleeper is a one fresh pillow. Um, I think you have one of those king size. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a awesome. So I'll do that awesome. and I'll actually almost kind of wrap it up and kind of hold the, hold the, the shoulder a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if, if anyone in the actual like medical profession saw me sleep, they would just cry immediately. Like a chiropractor would just lose his mind and pull his hair out instantly. <laughs> and then I have another smaller one that like basically just wanders around depending on how hot or cold it is or like how have I done 12 hours of construction and I need more support, you know, from building the cozy bar, then I'll bring the third pillow in for more shoulder support or whatever it yeah. is. So it's all over the board and um, I'm a physiological nightmare. So it's great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I um, promised myself I wouldn't judge anyone's sleeping position, but I am glad to hear you're not a stomach sleeper. That's the worst. Not thing. a stomach sleeper. No, no, no. Got rid of, I actually stopped that in college. I was one in, until college and then got out of that. So side sleeper, but it is what it is. But um, most of the time sleep pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. This definitely helps every now and then. So, mm -hmm. um, yep. Listen, I am so appreciative. I know you don't have a lot of time off. So the fact that you took time out of your usual and insane life to spend a little bit of time with us and answer my questions and just hang out with me. I really appreciate it. Obviously a big fan. Um, I want other people to be a big fan. So where can they find you online and how can they support you and all of your wonderful businesses? Well, um, all of them link together. So if you go to any of our websites, libertytlh.com, elcosneratlh.com, bar1903tlh.com, <laughs> probably guess what Hawthorne is, hawthorntlh.com. <laughs> they all uh, link together so you can find us online that way um, and just kind of go down the rabbit hole. That's kind of the idea is that like, I love the fact that everyone seems to have a different favorite of all four, like no one has the same favorite. Oh, I love this from this restaurant. My favorite is this from this restaurant. And it always seems to be different. So it's really cool to cast that wide net um, and capture a lot of people's either imagination or their taste. So which is really cool. Everything's delicious. I mean, Welsh rare bit. I'm not even gonna tell people what Welsh rare bit is. I want them to go to your website and figure it out. We'll send them on a little scavenger hunt. A fun take on it, you yeah. Get those, you get those collie tots back. Those were amazing. Those were good. Yeah, we definitely like those. Cauliflower's back in season, so we might have to figure that one out. All right, call me. Let me know. Absolutely. But now, any chance again. to get a chance to hang out with you guys is awesome. So I know. It's, it's, I, we, we miss seeing you. Tell Brianna hi and thank you so much. And we, again, are so appreciative of you doing this. And can't wait to see you in person soon. Cheers, See you bye. sooner than later. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye.